Picking up from the last video, we learned about time-intensive utility yielding commodities and good-intensive utility yielding commodities, and that these are essentially substitutable. You can produce with more time and less goods, or you can produce with more goods and less time. Maybe you are working a lot, and so you find that good intensive commodities are a better uh, route for you. In other words, you go to work, you get paid for that work, and then you go shopping for most of the stuff you have. You may even hire someone to clean your house. You may hire someone to do your laundry, probably hiring people to assemble your food at fast food restaurants, so on and so forth. In contrast, uh, you could substitute away from good intensive commodities to time intensive. Maybe you don't have to work a lot. Maybe you have a lot of free time. Maybe you're retired. In that case, you might make a lot of meals at home. You might decide to go walking in the park, right? Uh, you could do a lot of things uh, without having money uh, that would be uh, utility yielding. Throughout life, we face this trade-off, and it's very common for young professionals that have their education and are starting to build their careers to work a lot and not have a lot of time left over to walk in the park and, you know, uh, make their own food. So they emphasize good intensive commodities uh, at that stage in their life. And then as they get older, they become uh, retirees and they end up shifting to time intensive commodities. Something else to consider though, regardless of your age, is how wages influence this substitution. As wages increase, labor time becomes more valuable because it's it's a larger payoff in terms of market goods. If you make minimum wage, the amount of goods that you can really acquire with a low wage is going to be limited. So you probably find yourself doing more time-intensive type um, production. However, as your wage goes up, now you're going to find that you can get more goods uh, with that higher income. So you shift away from time-intensive to good-intensive commodities. In other words, when you make minimum wage, you probably clean your own house and are more likely to make your own meals at home. But as those wages go up, you're going to find hiring someone to do uh, your chores is going to be more fruitful. Let's talk about this allocation of time within the household and the decision making that has to be considered. Household members allocate competing uses of time to maximize household utility. They must determine which members will produce utility yielding commodities with labor, household, and consumption time. This is going to vary by household. And there are no obvious rules as to who should do what within the household. However, there are historic patterns that we'll want to consider and explain. And there's also a thought process that household members go through to determine who is best suited to do the different household uh, jobs. A lot of it has to do with comparative advantage. Comparative advantage is in economics producing at the lowest opportunity cost. And keep in mind that comparative advantage is very different than absolute advantage, which is lower resource cost. I'm going to give you a simple example just to solidify our understanding of this concept before we apply it to the household. Let's say that we have uh, two people in a household. We have a father and a son. And in a typical household, suburbia, there's a yard that has to be maintained and mowed. Let's say that the father, being older, more experienced, can mow that yard in 30 minutes. But the son, he's young, inexperienced, it's going to take him two hours. Well, from the standpoint of the lowest resource costs, the father wins. He uses less labor time than the son does and therefore he has the absolute advantage in producing a 
mowed yard. We all know that the father is not likely to mow that yard, though, which means in terms of this household, something else must be determining who mows the yard, something other than absolute advantage. And that's what, because it's not the resource that is give, being given up. It's the next best alternative use of that resource. And that's what we call the opportunity cost. For example, the father probably has a job that he can earn good money in. Let's say that he's an attorney and makes $200 an hour. The son, probably not so uh, productive in the labor market. Let's say he makes $15 at working at McDonald's. Well, going back to our previous numbers, if it takes the father 30 minutes to mow the yard, his next best alternative for gone, his opportunity cost is $100, right? Because he earns $200 an hour, he would give up half an hour. So the opportunity cost of mowing that yard, if the father does it, is $100. If instead the son does it, he makes $15 at McDonald's per hour. It takes him two hours to mow the yard. $15 times two is $30. The son has a opportunity cost of $30. What we've done here is we've taken the resources that they're using, but we've applied a value to them in their next best use. And if you do that, you can find out who has the comparative advantage. And it's obvious that the son has the comparative advantage because it takes it uh, costs him $30, whereas the father, it would cost $100 to mow that yard. All right, so now that you have a quick review of comparative advantage, we can apply it to the household decision-making and get a sense why throughout history this has uh, brought about some interesting trends. Traditionally, men have had a comparative advantage in the labor market and women in households. And there's many theories about why this has occurred, but there's four areas that it seems to come down to. One is socialization. The question is, do we socialize young girls to develop a comparative advantage in household time and socialize young boys to develop a comparative advantage in market time. An example of this might be if we give a doll to a young girl uh, or have her uh, working in the kitchen with mom, uh, then we might be developing a advantage in the household. Whereas if we give the little boy a toy gun and a um, you know a hammer and drill set we might be socializing the little boy to be productive in a market-based job or in the military, something like that. So some would say that that's an aspect of why we've had these differences in, in household uh, production. Another one is the types of jobs available. You know, uh, are the jobs that are in the marketplace attractive to women and men equally? Uh, if they're not, then it's possible that one group in this case, women might be more inclined to specialize in household production as opposed to market-based production. Biology, some people contend, has to do with this, that there are just natural differences uh, between men and women that show up um, in, the, in the household in terms of their comparative advantages and the types of roles that they choose to play. And one example of this would be uh, to the extent women are going to have children uh, more frequently than men, then we might expect women to be more likely to specialize at home uh, than men. And then labor market discrimination. If there is discrimination that limits access to jobs for women, uh, then they simply would specialize in production where there is access, the household. So there's theories about that. Now, it's possible that uh, these are uh, explanations. It's possible they're not and that there's others. But these are the ones where the discussions are typically gravitating towards 
in labor economics. When it comes to children, they've traditionally had a comparative advantage in household time towards human capital. And it could be that a child, because they have such a low market value, uh, some children can't even work because they're too young to legally produce in the marketplace. So they have zero market value. And some children who are able to work, they have less experience and less education because of their age. So either they're not able to earn a wage in the marketplace or it would be disproportionately low. So that's going to, by itself, lead towards more specialization within the household as opposed to uh, the labor market. So within the household, what does a child specialize in? Well, typically, education, schooling. Because by giving a child, by allocating their time towards schooling, you are making them, in the future, more valuable in the marketplace. Of course, if we don't want to make that child more valuable in the marketplace, then we might educate them in household production. And either way, we're trying to accomplish an increased productivity in the labor market or in the household for the future. So they can eventually be on their own and uh, take care of themselves. Now let's talk about the income and substitution effects within the Becker model. We already learned these effects in Chapter 2. Recall that as wages go up, there is an income effect that causes higher income and therefore the desire to consume more normal goods. Leisure is a normal good, so we work less. Therefore, higher wages cause an income effect, leading us to work less. In contrast, the higher wages cause a substitution effect that leads to a greater opportunity cost to leisure. Sitting on the couch when you have a low wage is a lot less costly than sitting on the couch when the wage is higher. As a result of higher wages raising the opportunity cost of leisure, people substitute away from leisure and work more. Therefore, higher wages cause an income effect of people working less and a substitution effect of people working more. Okay, that's the review from the basic leisure labor model we studied before. All Becker does is nuance this a little bit. The same relationships exist. For Becker, higher wages increase income, and that causes a reallocation away from labor towards leisure. But it's more specific. You're, you're going from the labor market to consumption. You're, remember, leisure in his model is really household time and uh, consumption time. So he's saying you're going to allocate away from the labor market towards consumption. Why? Because if you have higher income, you have more goods to enjoy, and you need time to play with them. It's a rich man's curse, right? As you get a higher income, you got your yacht, you got your cars, you got all sorts of other toys to play with, but you need time to consume them and enjoy them, and that's time that can't be allocated to the labor market. So as wages go up, people work less so they can allocate their time towards household consumption to enjoy those goods, Becker's income effect. Becker's substitution effect says higher wages are going to increase the opportunity cost of leisure, causing a reallocation of time. Well, in the other model, the labor-leisure model, it was a allocation of time away from leisure to uh, labor, to uh, the labor market. Here it's just more refined. Leisure for Becker is household and consumption time. So you're really moving away from household consumption time to the labor market. Another way of putting this is you're going to allocate your, your uh, time away from time-intensive commodities to good-intensive commodities. You know, when you go on vacation, you're going to fly rather than drive, so you don't waste time losing the higher wages that you get. 
So those are the two effects, income and substitution, same relationships as before, just more nuanced.